grace to you and his joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, last week, if you recall, we talked about prayer. And today I'd like to talk with you about fasting. Because if you read the Bible, those often go together, right? You hear about prayer and fasting all the time. The two are sort of married and intertwined with each other. So, when was the last time you heard a sermon about fasting? Never. Did you ever? Never, right. Pretty much, we never hear about fasting. But you're going to hear one today. And very important. What's the purpose of fasting? Does God actually want us to fast? Why would we fast? Might we be missing something that is a superpower that you might want to put as an into your arsenal for a powerful life with God. Well, let's talk about that and see what God teaches us about it in His Word. First of all, what is fasting? Let me give you a, a, just a definition here. Fasting is to go without food or certain types of food for a certain amount of time for a spiritual purpose. Did you get that? So you're going without food or a certain part uh, kinds of food for a certain amount of time for a spiritual purpose. Great power. What kinds of uh, fasts are there in the Bible? You got one fast where Moses fasted from water and food. Now I'm not going to recommend that, especially for 40 days. He went without it for 40 days. That's a supernatural fast when God gave him the Ten Commandments. You also have fasts in the Bible where people just fast from food. Another fast you can have in the Bible is just fasting from certain types of food. Like we read there in Daniel a few moments ago. where Daniel says in Daniel 10, In those days I, Daniel, ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself for the full three weeks. So he ate some food, but not certain kinds of richer foods to draw near to the Lord. But so fasting is to go without food or certain types of food for a certain amount of time for a spiritual purpose. Now, let me ask you, is that something we might want to do? Or you might want to do? And, uh, you know, at first glance, you might be like, no way. Why would I want to do that? Because I love food. <laughs> I want to eat. I enjoy food. Pastor, what are you talking about? Going without food. I'm going to get weak. I'm going to flick myself. You're preaching me to put myself into pain. And I don't like pain. I run from pain. So why would I want to do such a thing as crazy as this? What do you want me to starve? What do you want me to die? Well, no. Remember, it's to go without food or certain types for a certain amount of time for a spiritual purpose. In other words, to put something to death inside of us that needs to die in order that what Christ has put inside of us might spring up to greater life. And that you might create a, a more powerful prayer heard by God with powerful answers for yourself or other people. Where you get God working fireworks of strength in your life. Now if I say it that way, would you like to fast? Would you like to see some fireworks? Sure. Are you willing to go through a little bit of pain to get to that? Well, is fasting something that God expects of us? Is it something that God commands us to do? Well, actually, in the Bible, in the New Testament, there's no command for you to fast. There's no demand for you to fast. But there's most certainly an encouragement for you to fast. And does God expect it of us? I believe He does. Kind of strange to hear, because in the modern world, nobody in the modern church seems to go fasting. But... Does God expect it? Well, I open up the Bible, and in Luke chapter 5, I read this. You know, the Pharisees, they come against Jesus, saying the disciples of John fast often and offer prayer. So do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. Jesus said, can you make the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom's with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Could you say that with me? They will fast in those days? They will. Jesus expects that his people will be fasting. Another one we could look at is Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 following. Jesus says, And when you fast, 
do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by men, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So, he says, when you fast. Notice he doesn't say, if you fast. He says, when you fast. Does that mean he expects that we're going to be fasting? Yeah. That God's people on earth until his coming will be performing this at certain appointed times as the Lord leads them to draw near to God and get super powerful answers? He expects it, and he even encourages it, to be sure. Now, if you fast... And you choose to fast even perhaps this week. I want to ask, what kind of company would you be keeping? Who would be your compatriots in this endeavor of yours? Well, you would have friends and fellow compatriots by these names. Moses, David, Elijah, Daniel, Hannah, Nehemiah, Esther, Ezra, Jehoshaphat, and the people of Nineveh. They would all be call you brothers because they all fasted in the Old Testament. Who in the New Testament would be your friends? Well, Anna the prophetess, Cornelius, John the Baptist and his disciples, Paul, Barnabas, Peter, and dun, 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 Jesus. Jesus. They all fasted. They all saw this as very important. Certainly encourage us to do it. They'd be your your companions, your fellow crew in this endeavor. So, what effect, though, did their fasting have? Was it super powerful? Well, let's take a look at that just a moment. Moses was fasting in the Old Testament, 40 days and nights on the mountain, and he received the Ten Commandments written with the finger of God. Does that sound pretty powerful? You have Elijah was fasting for 40 days when he ran from Jezebel and her wrath to Mount Sinai. Daniel fasted, as we read a few moments ago there, for three weeks. And as soon as he fasted, here comes Gabriel in swift flight from heaven, an angel to his deliverance to make him know. Hannah, she couldn't have any babies. For years, she fasted and prayed and received power to conceive a son. Esther and the Jews fasted. Remember when Haman sought to slaughter them all? And they had a fast and prayed, and God turned the tides of war so that they became the victors. The men of Nineveh, they fasted when God was about to smite and crush them for their sin, and God turned their, uh, his wrath into a rainbow of grace. Jehoshaphat, the king, fasted when there were enemy armies surrounding him by the thousands and thousands. And he was overpowered. And he didn't even have to lift a finger in the battle. God just wiped out his enemies and he just collected up the spoil. In the, in, uh, in the New Testament, Anna the prophetess uh, fasted and she got to see the baby Jesus before she died. Cornelius, he was the first convert to Christianity from the Gentiles, and it was in the context of a fast that God heard his prayer and said, Peter, go down and save this man with the gospel. The people at Antioch were in the middle of a fast when the Holy Spirit spoke and appointed Paul and Barnabas, saying, go out and carry the mission to the Gentiles. Paul fasted and received his sight, and Jesus fasted 40 days in the wilderness and returned from the wilds in the power of the Spirit, working signs and wonders with great strength and preaching the gospel. And so, I don't know, not really too powerful, huh? <laughs> These all took place in the context of fasting with prayer. And so, would you like to see fireworks in your life? Might this be something you might want to put into your arsenal of things you do with the Lord? Well, if this is the case, then if all the heroes of the Bible fasted 
went without food for certain periods of time to make their prayers the more powerful in heaven, why don't we fast? Why don't we fast? I don't fast either very much. I'd like to start this week. Why not? Well, here's a couple of reasons, I think. Number one, because you don't know anything about it. You haven't been taught. And when was the last time you heard a sermon on fasting? It's like once in your life, maybe never growing up. Secondly, no one around us fasts. <laughs> Where are you going to find a living example to inspire you when the rest of Christendom is not fasting for the most part? Thirdly, it involves a measure of pain. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to you. Put yourselves in some pain. Who wants to hear that? We run from pain. We go in the opposite direction from affliction. We live in this generation where it's like, feed your hunger. You know, quench your thirst and get it now. Don't wait for anything. Why would I want to fast if that's the culture I'm living in? It's pain. And lastly there, we don't understand the power that is at work when we fast. Personally, I haven't fasted very much I did fast more when I was in my 20s. I uh, would fast for a day or three days, sometimes five days. I remember uh, one time I was out in the wilderness in Connecticut, in the woods at least, some far way out. Didn't see anybody for five days. I'd chosen this place with a nice rock, and there was a tree that had fallen over against another one that formed this perfect cross. So I thought, there's a place to fast for five days. So I went out there with just some water and a little bit, tiny bit of food, but just enough to barely get. In fact, no, I didn't have any food. What I thought about was blueberry pancakes and Pop-Tarts for five minutes. <laughs> One night in the middle of a rainstorm that's coming down, a deer walks through my little camp, and he was like, whoa, what are you doing here? And I was like, whoa, and he ran, and I was about to run. And did I see fireworks? Well, not necessarily fireworks, but I did come out much more powerfully and with some amazing answers to prayer. So. Not sure why we don't fast, but let's consider starting that this week. But if you're going to do that, we've got to understand the purpose of fasting. What are we doing when we fast? Why would you do such a thing? Well, God tells us in the Bible about fasting so that we can understand it, at least to some degree. Let's take a look at uh, Psalm 69. Number one, you fast to do this. Let's see if you can tell me. David says, I humbled my soul with fasting. I became, I made sackcloth my covering. As for me, my prayers to thee, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of thy steadfast love, answer me. So what would you say? Number one reason to fast. I humbled my soul with fasting. What do we do? It's a way and a time to go down and humble yourself through the affliction to kill inside of it what you need to kill, namely pride, to make yourself weak a little bit so that the inner man in you that God's put in comes out the stronger. Because how are you going to get your prayers heard? Is every prayer heard? Well, God does hear our prayers. But there was a man that was very proud, Jesus says, went into the temple one day and said, I'm so thankful, God. I'm holier than all these other jerks around here. <laughs> like that tax collector over there. I, I fast twice a week. Isn't that lovely? He was proud, and Jesus says his prayer was not heard. But the humble person, the tax collector, who wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven, Jesus says his prayer was the one that was heard. So number one, fasting is a way to come to God by taking a humble approach. And he'll look down and say, wow, that's a beautiful prayer. I want to answer that super powerfully. It was made in humility. So that's number one, to humble yourself. Secondly, Fasting is a great way to draw near to God because it frees up the time that you would normally spend with food to be spent in quality with your Father above. Do you know how much time you spend with food every day? <laughs> Have you ever fasted for a, 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 like a meal or a day or a couple days? You will see how much time you spend thinking about food. I mean... In your normal day, you get up, you think, what am I going to eat? Then you prepare the food. Then you eat the food. Then you clean up from the food. And as soon as you do that, you think, what am I going to have for lunch? And then you prepare that. And then you eat that. And you clean up from that. And then what am I going to have for dinner? And then you eat that. And then snacks in the middle. Our entire lives are thinking about food. 
it's consuming our time. It's eating up all of our time, food. If you just ditch it for a meal or a day, you have so much time in your hands you won't even believe it. And if you use that to draw near to God, won't God take notice and say, that's marvelous. Let's answer this in a super way. Thirdly, fasting is a way to conquer the God of the belly. The God of the belly? I never heard about a God of a belly. What are you talking about? Well, there is a God of the belly. The devil has always tempted people with the God of the belly. Where would that be in the Bible? I don't know. You don't know? Well, let's open it up. Genesis 3, the serpent, the snake, the dragon, subtle, comes to the woman. His first words to her, did God really say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? <laughs> what is he tempting her to? Eat. Food. He's tempting her stomach. You know, food is a gift of God to us. We should receive it with thanksgiving, but it can become an idol if it gets in, our, in the way of our relationship with God. And he wanted to put the God of the belly between her and God, and she chose it because it says, along with Adam, when she saw that the tree was uh, good to the eyes and uh, good for food and a delight to the eyes, she took of its fruit and <coughs> ate. And so her husband ate. The first sin in the Bible was over food, the God of the belly. Another one you could look at was that story when, uh, remember Jacob and his brother Esau? Esau has the birthright. He's out hunting in the, in the wilderness. And he comes in famished. And there's Jacob where he usually was, hanging out in the kitchen. As uh, Randy would say, a girly man. But no, I think that's a good thing to do. He's cooking. He's got porridge. Oh, please, give it to me. Give it to me, says the brother. Jacob says, if you sell me your birthright, I'll give you this porridge. What's the birthright worth to me if I die? Give me the porridge. And he sells his birthright the Bible says, for a single meal, he gave up on God's blessings to feed his stomach. He fell by food. Eve fell by food. We could look at another one here, one more. Old Testament, Israel. They're in the wilderness. And they were being given manna to eat. They didn't like it. Now, there was a rabble that was among the people. They had a strong craving. And the people of Israel wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, oh, the onions, and the garlic. Oh, yeah, the garlic. They must have been Italian. They wanted the garlic. What's the matter with the garlic in this uh, I wanted the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there's nothing at all to look at but this manna. And they tested God in the wilderness. What's that again? The God of the belly. They're going after their stomachs. They're craving. And it got in the way of their relationship with God. And Paul says in Philippians 3, Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So, do you think that if we put away food for a while, that'd be a great way to show God, look God, I love food. I'm thankful for food. I receive it with thanks, but I am willing to put that away to show you that you, God, are number one in my life. Not this food by which all these other people fell. You are number one. You are the tops. You're my love. You're my king. And I'll show it to you by putting this aside. If God is up there and nobody else in Christendom more or less is fasting these days, he's going to look at See, I'm like, Jesus, come over here, look at this. Did you see that? Down there in Merritt Island, that person just, he's fasting for me. <laughs> Do you think God will say, wow, I'm going to give a fantastic answer to that prayer because look how he's drawn near to me by giving that up and afflicting himself. And fourthly, fasting, it just seems to be attended with superpower. And I don't know why. I don't have all the answers for you. But every time you see somebody doing that in the Bible, for real, doing a real fast, that's when you get all the miracles of the Bible. That's when God writes on a stone and gives the Ten Commandments. That's when God opens a womb and 
the child, a uh, woman can conceive. That's when God defeats enemies. He does all kinds of things in fast. I don't know why, but he does. And so the fourth point is, it just is. Fasting is powerful. And this kind of demon, Jesus says, can only come out by prayer and fasting. When the disciples couldn't get rid of it, he says you need prayer and fasting to get and dislodge this one. So, are you going to fast this week? Consider it? Have I convinced you? Maybe skip one meal, maybe a couple. Well, not all fasts are equal, we need to understand. You need to fast in truth. What are two ways in which you can have a false fast? Well, one way to have a false fast is to go into it with pride. Like Jesus says, that Pharisee who went into the temple and he says, I'm so wonderful. I'm holier than this person over here because I fast twice a week. Jesus says, that person's fasting, useless. It's a waste of time. It's rubbish. It's garbage and it's evil because it's about pride. God says, you humble yourself in a fast because if you humble yourself, I will exalt you. So that would be a wrong fast. And the right one is to go by in humility. <clears throat> Second way to mess up <laughs> would be if you go to God in a fast, but then also in your other hand you're still sinning. Namely, doing something evil towards other people. God's not going to hear that one. Look over here in Isaiah 58. God says, uh, the people of Israel say to God, why have we fasted and you haven't seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? God says, because, behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. You oppress your workers. You fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Did you get that? So you can't just go wickedly. And then notice, though, that fasting will make your voice to be heard on high if you do it right. He said, God says, isn't this the fast that I choose? That you loose the bonds of wickedness and undo the thongs of the yoke? To let the oppressed go free? To break every yoke? Isn't it to share your bread with the hungry? Bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? And what's the result of a right fast? God says, then shall your light break forth like the dawn. And your healing shall rise up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. You know, that's the fast I want to do this week with you. I want to fast in truth, and God says, here I am, Greg. Here I am, Christ Lutheran, and my healing spring up speedily, and God be my rear guard. Mm, good stuff. So, how mighty, then, is a fast. Consider this one. In 1 Kings 21, Elijah meets one of the most wicked kings of Israel. His name is Ahab. <coughs> Ahab, the wicked king. He was horrible. And Ahab sees Elijah coming and he says, Have you found me, O my enemy? Elijah answered, I have found you. And because you have sold your soul to do what's evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I bring, will bring evil upon you, says the Lord. I'll utterly sweep you away and cut off from Abraham every male bond or free in Israel. But what do we read next? When Abraham heard these words, he rent his clothes, put sackcloth upon his flesh, and he fasted, laying in sackcloth. What do you think happened? God, it says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Have you seen how Abraham has humbled himself before me? Because he's humbled himself before me, I'll not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days, I'll bring the evil upon his house. So, that is so powerful. God is about to go slam with thunder, lightning, rain, and hail. But because he fasted before the Lord, humbling himself by it, God turned it into a rainbow and blue skies, at least for him in his days. Secondly, if you think of uh, Daniel, what happened in his fast? He says, I prayed to the Lord, my God, seeking him with supplications and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and that of Israel, while I was speaking in prayer during the fast, 
the man Gabriel, seen in a vision at first, came to me in swift flight upon at the time of the evening sacrifice. He came and said to me, O oh, Daniel, I have now come to give you wisdom and understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, a word went forth. And I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. If you pray and fast this week, do you think that might happen to you? <coughs> when did the angel get dispatched from God? At the beginning of his supplications. It took the angel a little while to get there. Don't know why. Maybe he was battling with some other angels, as we see in Daniel happens. But as soon as he humbled himself and sought the Lord by fasting, God said, Did you see that, Jesus? Look at that one. Daniel. Gabriel, come over here. Go see that man. Make him understand the vision. Because he fasted. God sends angels, but he also gives power to go forward. It was the, the elders at Antioch that were worshiping the Lord and fasting in Acts chapter 13. And when they did that, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul and send them to the work to which I give them, to carry my word to the Gentiles. In the context of a fast, the Holy Spirit opens his lips and begins to speak into your life, give you power to go forward. And then he will deliver you from fear and from your enemies. We have many examples of that, but how about King Jehoshaphat? Imagine we're here in <coughs> Cape Canaveral, and Merritt Island's against us. 10,000 man army. <laughs> Cocoa Beach has a 20,000 man army. They're heading our way. Titus fell. Those wicked people. <laughs> They're marching in our direction at this very moment, and they'll be here by noon, after the service today. <coughs> Well, that was the case for Jehoshaphat. They're on his heels at his doorsteps. What does he do? King Jehoshaphat feared. He set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all Judah. And in this battle, he doesn't even have to lift his tiny little finger. God goes out and goes, whoosh, go away the enemies. He slays them all. And all he has to do is get up, walk out there, and pick up the prizes. That are the leftovers. Because he was in a fast with all the people. And if you want to set yourself free, set other people free, your loved ones that are free, why not go to God in a fast with prayer? The disciples again came to Jesus saying one time, why couldn't we cast out that demon? Jesus said to them, because this kind of demon can only be driven out by prayer and some manuscripts add, and fasting. You know, some are easy, some are very hard to get out and dislodge, Jesus says, but for prayer and fasting will do it. Think about it. And fasting in the Bible, I'll tell you, it is mysterious. I don't understand everything, but you always see the greatest miracles and fireworks of God associated with it. And let's conclude with Jesus. He was in the wilderness 40 days, says the Bible. And he ate nothing. When they were headed, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you're the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. What is he saying? Jesus, go after the God of the belly. Remember Eve. Remember Esau. Remember the people in the wilderness. Go after the belly. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. That's my bread to eat. Get away with your, uh, your other one. He conquered the God of the belly. Jesus did that for us because he loves us. And then he went to the cross for us. And do you know that that was in the context of a fast? The last supper was the last supper. At the end of it he says, I shall not eat or drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He was fasting the day he saved you. No food, no drink. He went to Caiaphas and to Annas and before Pilate. He went to the cross. It was in that context. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit and won your perfect salvation to give you eternal life. In the context of a fast. Yes, God's power and his fireworks, his strength and his might is most often seen throughout history in the context of a fast. So, will you fast this week? Will you consider it? 
you know, let's receive food with thanksgiving. It's a great gift, but fasting may be a greater gift. Let's go for a meal for a half a day without food. Maybe even you choose a whole day. Will your light break forth like the dawn when God answers you speedily? Well, let's do it until that day comes when he will say to us in his kingdom, my saints, you need hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike you, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will be your shepherd. And I will guide you to springs of living water.